มื่อมองดูนกพกพินบินลับไปเมื่อมองสายชนถึงไหลริน So yeah, uh, watch for oncoming traffic. There have been accidents. People, two people diving on the mat at the same time from different directions. I know it sounds funny unless it's your head. And then it's not quite so funny. Okay. All right. So uh, the most fundamentally important concept in traditional Thai yoga. Um, we say traditional Thai massage. I don't use that very much, and the reason why there's no such thing. Okay, uh, traditionally or historically, it doesn't exist. Thai massage, is, and I'm partly to blame for this. I won't take full responsibility. I'll take some little piece of responsibility, since I was the first person to be certified as a teacher in Thailand who came to the United States to teach. People would ask me, "What do I do? What am I doing?" And I would tell them, "I'm do I'm doing yoga therapy from Thailand," and they would go. Blank, glassy-eyed stare. They would look at me and they would go, "Yeah, nothing comes to mind. I have no idea what's yoga." So I opened my school in 1983 in Atlanta, Georgia. In 1983, there were no yoga schools. So there were no yoga schools. There was nobody teaching yoga. There was uh, Yoga Journal was a pamphlet that was locally distributed in California. It wasn't even a magazine. Okay. Um, so when I would tell people that I was doing a yoga thing, they would look at me and go, "Yeah, I, I, what? What? India? India? Oh, I heard of India." Isn't that where tea's from? <laughs> you know, and and Indian food. They'd heard of Indian food. You know, curry. They heard of curry. Oh, is that like curry? Like once I told a, a client, a person, prospective client, that I do yoga therapy, and she looked me right in the eye and goes, "Is that like curry?" Oh my God. <laughs> I mean, are you going to cook for me? Is that what is that what we're talking about? Because all she knew about yoga was it came from India, and the only thing she knew about India was curry. 1983. You think that's ancient history? It seems like it, right? Seems like it. So then I would go, no, no, it's yoga from Thailand, and they'll go Thai, Thai, Thai. Thai. Never heard of Thailand. Is that Taiwan? Is that where computers come from? Taiwan? I'm like no, Thailand. They're like, no, nah, nothing comes up unless they were a veteran. Vietnam era veterans knew where Thailand was because R and R for Vietnam veterans. Was in Thailand. There were six American Air Force bases in Thailand. That if you were an R and R, short R and R from Vietnam, you flew over Cambodia and were right in Thailand and either Chiang Mai or Bangkok, and that's the way it was. And even when I was in the Air Force, the first place I went to to get orders was at the Just Mag headquarters on uh, Vien Thai Road at the Vien Thai. Hotel second floor in Bai Lan Phu, Bangkok. I know it doesn't mean anything to you, but the only people who went to Thailand were American Air Force, American vets, American servicemen on R and R, and so on. So if I had a client who had that background, they knew what I was talking about. Oh, Thailand! Yeah, I know where that's at, it, but they didn't know what yoga was. And if they were not a veteran, a Vietnam veteran, and had not been to Asia or Southeast Asia, they didn't have a clue what yoga was. There were the first yoga books weren't even published until the 60s, and then there was just a couple, and they weren't widely distributed at that time. Most people had never even heard of it. And so I had a hard time. So I would just tell them it's like massage from Thailand. And and I and people who came after me and like that, we would just say to keep it simple. Forget the yoga thing, because then I had a problem. I was in Atlanta, and Atlanta, Georgia is really conservative religiously, especially in the past. Okay, uh, for example, my mom, my mom's family was fundamental Southern Baptist. 
First Baptist Church, fundamentalist Baptist. My mom never drank a drink her whole life. She's never smoked a cigarette. My mom never put makeup on her face, because only whores do that. And my mom never dyed her hair, and et cetera. But she ate Cheetos until she weighed 500 pounds. But that's another story. The thing about it was, though, she's fundamentalist, very, very strict. And when I told my mama that I was going to Asia to learn yoga, she got on her knees and she cried and grabbed my leg and asked me, please don't go join Satan's army. And she wasn't kidding. That's my mother, all right? So if that's my mom, what's my neighborhood like? If that's my neighborhood, what's my town like? My church that I grew up in, in Atlanta, Georgia, when I opened my first office on Buckhead, on Peachtree in Buckhead, Atlanta, Georgia, 1983, my church organized a protest where they came over and picketed my office with signs, down with Satan, uh, Buddha is Satan, yoga is satanic. And they got in front of my store and they walked in front of my office. And they did this for days. In fact, they did it until I went to the church and asked the elders to stop. I physically had to go and have a meeting with my church. And I had to resign from my church. I had to tell my formally resign, I had to sign a waiver, I had to sign a piece of paper saying that I quit and I'm no longer affiliated with this organization and I don't love Jesus anymore. And then because I was no longer a member of the church and I was no longer blah, 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 then they, they had no reason to, to chastise me to correct me. See, they thought they were doing a good thing. If they embarrass me, I'll quit what I'm doing. I'll come back to the church. I'll be a good little whatever. But I've never been good at being a good little anything, so why start? Why stop? Who cares? I have convictions. I work according to my inner light and my convictions, no matter what's going on around me. Okay? I recommend it. Highly recommend it. I learned this in Thailand. I didn't learn this at home. I learned this from the old man, from Pak Kru Samai Mesaman. Because he told me that true medicine comes from the heart. Your heart. Not somebody else's heart. True medicine comes from your heart. And the most important thing about what we, a lot of people call Thai massage, I don't call it Thai massage because in Thailand, Thai massage is back rubs at the beach for tourists. It's a rub down that uh, lowly educated people do on tourists to make money. God bless them. And they're very successful at that. Although not now. That's all gone now. But traditional medicine is what's done in hospitals. So I'm going to show you the traditional medicine, okay? We call it yoga therapy, Thai yoga therapy, Thai Ayurveda. The most important thing about a treatment protocol in Thai yoga therapy is the practice of puja. Number one, it is the most important. It's what's carved in stone on the walls of Wat Po and on the walls of Wat Suan Dok, on the walls of Wat Sawankalok, and so on. It is not carved in stone, an endless repertoire of yoga postures. That is actually not carved in stone. That is not what's on the walls of the temples. What's on the temples is the actual term, pro mi we han si, the four divine states of loving kindness and how you, uh, of unlimited infinite thinking and loving kindness and how uh, what they are, the waterfall description that I gave you, that kind of thing, that's carved in stone on the walls, okay? If we could go to Thailand now, I would take you and I would show you, all right? Because that's fun to see in person, right? Uh, but the application of that concept, Pramibhuhan Si, is a, is a philosophy of Theravada Buddhism. 
and of classic Ayurveda too, I want to say. But the application of it in principle in therapy on the mat, let's say, and we'll say on the mat, on the table, on the chair, because traditionally, actually right now in Thailand, this is not done on mats in hospitals. Hasn't been done on mats in hospitals for 30, 40 years. In Thailand, when you get this therapy in a hospital, you're always on a table, okay? We teach it on the mat, to teach you the traditional body mechanics and orientations and postures, the traditional yoga postures. But as soon as you know them, and as soon as you know a therapeutic protocol, the next step is to learn how to apply it on a table, okay? Or on a portable massage chair. I introduced that to Thailand about 40 years ago. Massage chair. That was not traditional. I brought one with me that I made. I made my first massage chair. I made my first massage table. You know, you couldn't buy them. There was no like Oak Works or let's call up, you know, some distributor and mail. I went to a furniture, no, I went to, uh, I had a client who uh, was a partner in a furniture company and asked him if he could build me a table with folding legs. Okay, uh, that company is still in existence. He formed a company, it's now called Blue Earth Tables. Okay, but Blue Earth Tables was a furniture company that made like um, uh, Ethan Allen style traditional southern furniture. And the clients, uh, the owner's wife was one of my clients. I asked him to make a portable table for me. I still have it, believe it or not. It's still perfectly as good as the day they made it. But it's, it's uh, longer and wider and thicker and heavier than a, a modern massage table like an Oak Works or something like that because I told him to make it so that it was strong enough I could jump up and down on top of it because that's what I intended to do and so he did and guess what it's still I still have the table okay so we practice on tables in clinics and hospitals. And I'm gonna show you that, we're gonna go over that. That's application of everything we do. But no matter practice on a mat or practice on a table, the most important part of a traditional Thai therapy session is puja, always has been, is now, always will be. So you, you've heard um, and seen me say maybe in some of the videos or whatnot, that the discipline is ancient, that it's old, that we've been doing Thai for a long time, a really long time. I told you my school, Pu Thai Suan, uh, which literally is translated as the school of the Buddha's heaven, okay, Pu Thai Suan, um, is a thousand years old and still in the same buildings, in the same location, in the same place in Ayutthaya. You could go there today if you could go to Thailand, which you can't. Okay, it's a complete lockdown of the country, no tourism. Okay, not since March. It's devastating. My Thai friends, um, oh my God. However bad you think it is here, worse there. Because Thailand's a dictatorship. I'm not going to talk a lot about that on a video. But it's a military dictatorship. They took over the country in a coup 15 years ago. All right, uh, anyway, fast track to now. Okay, the way that my teachers explained it to me is we have 10,000 techniques of healing just like Quan Yin has 10,000 arms. So Guan Yin, as the Thais call her, Guan Yin has 10,000 arms, okay? And if you see a statue or a painting or a likeness of Quan Yin, okay, who's a revered deity in Thailand, in every hand is something in every hand is something. There's an object in every hand. Or each hand is in a mudra, okay? A shape of the fingers, an articulation, a yoga posture of the hands, okay? And this, this is Kuan Yin mudra, okay? So there even is a Kuan Yin mudra. That's Kuan Yin holding the lotus flower, okay? Uh, heart mudra, microcosmic orbit, Kuan Yin holding the, the manifesting unconditional love and the lotus is the physical manifestation of love. That's what the lotus flower represents. Some people say, oh, it's consciousness is all. Okay, that's cool. I like that too. Okay, but that's not Thai. Okay, so uh, we, we continue.
In every hand is a tool. That's a technique for healing. That's a technique for bringing a relief of suffering to a person. So 10,000 hands is a metaphor for infinity. All that there is. So how many yoga postures are there? Nobody knows. Okay, why? Because it's infinity if you count a variation. So if you have Paschimottanasana or you have a full forward bend, well, how many types of full forward bends are there? Well, there's full forward bends sitting. There are full forward bends sitting upright. There are full forward bends laying on your side. There's full forward bends on your back. It's called the plow. There's full forward bends standing. There's four, and, uh, and then there are sub variations of all of them. So just Paschimottanasana, there's a hundred variations. It's just one yoga posture, there's a hundred variations. You could do an hour long vinyasa, never do the same posture for longer than a 10 count, and never get to the end of the variations of forward bend. That's how many there are. And how many yoga postures are there? All right. In the Haraka, uh, uh, Harapika, there are only four that are listed. So in the oldest yoga document existing in India today, the most ancient manuscript that exists that references what we call yoga or uses the word yoga, there are only four postures that are mentioned. There's a full forward bend, there's a back bend, there's a twisting pose, it's called a twisting pose. It's not called triangle, it's not called warrior three, it's not, that's all modern. That wasn't invented until the 50s and 60s. Um, so it's called twisting pose and supported shoulder stand. Okay, so those are the only four postures that are listed by, that with a description in the oldest yoga literature known to exist Currently, there may be other literature. There's certainly been literature less old than that that listed more. And in the 50s, we have Iyengar publishing Light on Yoga and his 100 Postures, uh, which was published for foreign tourists, by the way, uh, according to Iyengar, okay? Because they needed books, because they didn't grow up doing the lifestyle of yoga. See, when I went to school, when I first went to school in yoga, we were not allowed to take notes, we were not allowed to take pictures, we were not allowed, not allowed, not allowed. We were not allowed to make drawings, we were not allowed. Why? Because at that time, even in the 70s, yoga teachers in India and in uh, Thailand and Burma and so on, Philippines and Indonesia and Malaysia believe that if you took a picture of a thing, you stole something from it. So if you took a picture, if I took a picture of you doing a yoga posture, you were less you the minute after I took the picture than when I took it. Because the picture itself was taking something of your soul, of your spirit, of your essence away from you. And in fact, in Thailand, it could get you killed in the country. If you went in, and right through the 80s, if you went outside of a major city, and if you were in the country, if you went to Noiseland, where her people are from, and you just started taking pictures of people, if somebody came up with a knife and stabbed you, and took that camera away from you and threw it down on the ground and smashed it, they would take your body to jail. Because that would not be a crime. Why? Well, you were stealing. No, I was just taking pictures. Right. You were stealing my life force. You were stealing my essence. Now they don't do that so much anymore. Now it's just Timbot. <laughs> Timbot, you want to take a picture, you got to pay. Everybody pays. Timbot, Timbot, Timbot. Ha. You want to be a model? Sibot. <laughs> right? <laughs> right? Sibot, Sibot, Timbots. Right? Now you pay. But that's the softening effect. Okay? And the, right through the 80s, if you did that, you could be stabbed. You could be killed. People were stabbed. People were killed. Cameras were destroyed. Snatched off your body. I physically watched, and at, literally at the most touristed temple in Thailand, which is the Grand Palace, where the Emerald Buddha is, I personally watched a tourist person who was next to me, about two people over, uh, 
who pulled a camera out of a fanny pack and was taking pictures of the Emerald Buddha from here with their camera, out, which they took out of the fanny pack. And I personally watched a guard come in from outside the building. So obviously they had cameras inside, video inside, because he, he came from outside. And he walked, sorted through the people, which is elbow deep people. There's always 500 people in the chapel, right? So it's a traffic jam. He sorted his way. I was all the way up front. He came all the way up front, and I sensed a disturbance in the field, and I turned around just in time to walk up behind this woman, walked up behind her, grabbed her by both ears, and jerked her to her feet. When she got to her feet, he spun her around, grabbed her camera, and snatched it away from her, and then grabbed her by one ear and dragged her out of the chapel. When he got to the door, he walked one step outside the door, took her camera, and smashed it on the ground. And then he put his finger in her and told her to get out and never come back. Now. And she was like, buh, buh, buh. And he pushed her. Didn't knock her down. It was kind of violent, see. In the Buddhist temple, the most famous Buddhist temple in Thailand. All right, if she had done that 10 years earlier, she might not have lived to get off the temple grounds. In the 1960s, the American government had to issue a bulletin to American servicemen about these kinds of things because about 20 American servicemen had been murdered in Thailand for doing things like taking pictures. So it w in my school was that strict. And in fact, I was never allowed to take pictures while I was there, okay? There are pictures now, and I did sneak a couple of pictures. Why? Because I'm bad, and I'm American. So I do have a couple of pictures, right? But there are my stuff. I took pictures of my stuff, right? Um, and all the pictures I do have, I have permission. But uh, that's another story. So there were no books. I wrote the first book ever published on Thai massage in English. I wrote it. I published it. 1982, Meta Journal Press, Nua Thai, Traditional Thai Medical Massage. I wrote, the, I wrote and published the first book ever published in the United States and English on Thai massage, okay? It was made from notes that I made after I left Thailand because I was not allowed to make notes while I was in Thailand. Not in the school, and I lived in the school. I had two cameras that were taken away from me and destroyed. Same in India. When I went to India, we were not allowed to take notes in class, in yoga class. Why? Yoga is a sacred practice. Sacred practice. Do you always take notes when you're praying? Do you know that every asana is a prayer? Every single one? Classically speaking, traditionally speaking, if you're a sadhu, there's no argument here. You're not gonna win an argument with a sadhu that every yoga posture is not a prayer. But you're saying, well, wait a minute, but you're moving. You're using your body. And they're like, and? Where did you ever get the idea that movement is not a form of prayer? Movement is prayer, breath is prayer, Thinking is prayer, singing is prayer, chanting is prayer. In fact, uh, we were told by our elders that we're supposed to cultivate an attitude of unceasing prayer. In other words, we're supposed to be praying all the time. So if I'm supposed to be praying all the time, am I not supposed to be praying when I'm doing my yoga? Of course, of course I am. In the system, the way this was built in is we were told puja is the most important part Puja is mostly, tr most correctly translated as, as uh, prayer. 
And what Pakhar Samai and the other teachers like uh, Ajahn Tawi and Ajahn Anantasuk and Ajahn Bunsorn and Ajahn Bila Asili Sopang and so on and so forth taught me was that if you took the 10,000 techniques of Thai and you eliminated all of them except for one, the only one that would be important that you could do and still get the results and not do any of the others was this, was puja. So a Thai session is puja, stuff in the middle, puja. The traditional model of medical application is puja, stuff in the middle, puja, and everybody does puja. Everybody does puja. Every doctor does puja. Every therapist does puja. Every practitioner does puja. Every teacher does puja. No exaggeration. Everybody does puja. And if you get into it with people and you say, well, you know, in the West, we don't have anything that's lasted a thousand years. Nothing. We have nothing that's lasted a thousand years. The only thing in Western culture that's lasted a thousand years is religion. Really, it's the only thing, which is based on what? Prayer. So from a philosophical construct, the oldest philosophical construct still functioning in a Western society today is the practice of prayer. Nothing else is equal. I will say astrology is also almost as old, maybe, maybe as old. Astrology, you know, that is the oldest science, not, not immunology, astrology. Okay, and yes, I'll argue, I can argue with you if you want to argue if astrology is a real science or not. It's way more real science than psychiatry. Don't get me started. <laughs> All right, so puja. So the old man, 36th generation grandmaster of our ancient school, told me that, that you could, I said, I, I would watch the, let, let, I got to put the conversation in context. I will watch old people practice, old yogis. You want to know what yoga is really about? Don't watch the 20 something sleeping about. 20 something sleep about even if they don't know yoga. It's called gymnastics. It's called acrobatics. It's called circus arts. It's called martial arts. It's called track and field. It's called 20-somethings <laughs> jump about, run about, and look what I can do. And I can go faster and higher and longer and further and stretch and more. And I can touch my toes. And oh, I'm so young, I can still touch my toes. You know, it's like uh, that's an age factor. It has nothing to do with philosophy. Okay, nothing, nothing to do with philosophy. You want to know what yoga is really about? You go to a place where there are old yogis, 80 year old yogis. There are places in Thailand, there are places in India, there are places in Laos, in Burma, where you can spend time with people who are 60, 70, 80, 90 years old who have been practicing Ayurveda and yoga all of their life. There are doctors who are still practicing in their 80s and in their 90s. And it's not uncommon. There's no like, oh, I retired, you know, I got the, I retired when I was 55 and got the big house and the golf, you know, country club and, you know, there's none of that. No, if you're a real doctor and you're really good, you don't retire. You die. You die. All good doctors don't ret right? Good doctors don't don't retire in the village. They just eventually die like everybody else. There's no reason to not practice medicine until the last day of your life. There's no reason. Okay? So, I would watch the old people and I watch them in the clinic and I watch them in the hospital, and I watch them in the school, and I would watch them practice on sick people. And we got sick people came to our clinic. I mean, oh my God. Anything you can imagine. Lot that you cannot imagine. And the eldest practitioners are the most senior, so the more serious the issue, the older the practitioner, generally speaking. The younger practitioners get the not quite so serious, it's just how it is. And maybe if you're a young practitioner, you've only been practicing five years or eight years, maybe your job is to cook for the older practitioners. 
Maybe your job is just to get water. Maybe your job is just to keep things fluid and, and filled and moving. And maybe that's your job. You know, uh, firewood is critical because there's no the electricity. So if we needed something boiled or cooked, like uh, to make a poultice, no, I prokop someone pry herbal poultice or bolus, it's called in Ayurveda. Uh, we had to uh, burn charcoal and make a fire to boil the water to steam the poultice to put on you. And so maybe that's your job as a as a younger. Uh, practitioner, younger therapist, you have to uh, m make fires all day. Make fires all day. You know, uh, I did that. I had to do that. All right. So, uh, what's the old people practice? Now we learned these flows that had 19 and 20 and 50 and 100 moves, vinyasas that were very complex. They had. Again, 50 moves, 100 moves, 150 moves that you do in a particular order and sequence, in a flowing sequence, and you go from posture to posture to posture to posture from A to Z. It's like reciting the freaking encyclopedia until one day it hit me, oh my God, I'm reciting the encyclopedia. These people have me reciting the encyclopedia. A, B, C, D, E, F, G, H, I, J, K, L, M, N, O, P, Q, R, S, T, U, V, W, X, Y, and Z. Because I went to Europe and in Switzerland they don't have a Z, they have a Z, okay? And in Britain they don't have a Z, they have a Z. Weird, I don't know what's up with those people. So I realized that the vinyasa that I was taught was the catalog, was the encyclopedia, because I would watch the old people practice, and you know what? They never did it. They never did the flow. They never did the style. They never did the sequence that we learned in class. They never did what we learned on the mat. They never did it with sick people. They did some things from it, they did some things like it. They did some things with other things. And you know what sometimes they did? Nothing. They put the person on the mat or table. They sat with them at their side or feet, depending on north or south. In the south of Thailand, uh, preferred is by the abdomen or head. In the north of Thailand, it's always the feet. You always start with the feet. Because we're Western, eclectic, we can do both, and often do. Some people even hold the hand. So, you know, there's all kinds of ways to start. And they would sit with the person, and in the South, they would just sit silently next to the person with their hand on their stomach for a period of time, which could be a minute, could be five minutes, could be half an hour. And then they would just, why? and say thank you, and leave. So there was no posturing. There was no facilitation of postures. Sound.